2023 to be a year of significant declines in inflation, and it's actually our job to make sure that that's the case. But I would tell you that, uh, you know, with inflation... Hello, uh, headline, welcome to headline, Financial uh, Stockholm. Today PCE is Monday, is February 27th, 2023. And uh, these are the uh, reflections and views of what we're seeing in the Swedish press and maybe how it would affect the economy and the markets, uh, and what you uh, could use as news and maybe the possible effects. Uh, however, for any investment strategies, of course, or investment advice, you should refer to your investment advisor and not take what we're saying as investment advice, but really just kind of, this is the news um, or what we're seeing. So uh, we ended the weekend uh, with discussion about the anniversary of the Ukrainian war and Russia, weapons support, uh, China, what they're going to be doing, potential actions, uh, Iran sending up drones and missiles uh, to uh, destroy tanks. Uh, and they're designed for the, uh, the Israeli tanks. Uh, and what the United States was going to be doing, if they're going to be sending over F-16 fighter jets, or if it's going to suffice with just A-10 tank busters, uh, and then the European NATO members, what they're going to be doing in terms of arms contributions, is there enough ammunition? Uh, this question about the ammunition production coming up again, so we see it not just from Jens Stoltenberg, uh, from the head of NATO, uh, or the you know NATO boss, um, you see it from other people. So uh, there's a question there. Um, so what does that mean for BAE? Are they going to have to step up the pace? Uh, will companies like Saab have to step up the pace? Will we see new orders coming in? Uh, remember, Europe has only contributed a, in total something like $10 billion. And uh, when you're saying only, I mean, $10 billion, it's a billion. Uh, whereas the United States has contributed $120 billion in terms of support. And, you know, that includes munitions and then payment for the government services and pensions and so forth in Ukraine. Um, so <clears throat> could there be a greater contribution coming from European states? Uh, we'll see. Would there be a greater contribution uh, in terms of the munition and ammunition? Um, so uh, we saw that. Uh, we still don't see any resolution on the pipeline uh, sabotage and um, what's happened there. Uh, but it looks like this is going to be another one of these confirmed conspiracies. So like the theory about lab leaks, uh, like the theory about uh, uh, masks, and like the theory about uh, the effectiveness of ivermectin, uh, what it can be used for, uh, these theories are you know, likely to resolve as uh, truth uh, or obvious truth sitting in front of you unless you want to deny it and play around with a different idea. Um, and so, uh, so that's what you're seeing uh, in the Swedish press. Um, and then um, we we had a uh, discussion over the weekend with uh, with their uh, with the economy office from the Swedish television. And um, uh, this woman has had a uh, fairly uh, fairly good career, um, and she's uh, generally bringing out good issues. Uh, but uh, this time on the uh, the report, um, they were talking about the Russian economy and how are the sanctions going. Uh, and how hard is it really to clip the strings uh, between the, say, uh, Russian economy and these companies? And so uh, what, this, uh, what the program did was uh, have uh, one of our largest pension funds CEO on. She was discussing um, the, uh, the effect on the economy and the companies. Uh, we had a uh, regional analysis uh, economist. Uh, then you had a technical economist from the, uh, from the market strategy. And then you had this woman. And uh, they discussed Russia and the sanctions. And they mentioned four different companies, Tetra Pak, one of our largest, uh, one of the uh, largest family fortunes created as a result of very similar to uh, the H&M story, uh, SEB. Um, uh, and they mentioned also Vattenfall, which is government owned. Uh, and then you also have uh, ESAB. So um, uh, ESAB is a welding company and a cutting company. Uh, and uh, Vattenfall is our power generator, but there the exposure could be as a result of the nuclear power fuel, um, which last year in, uh, uh, in the springtime, Vattenfall said they were cutting their ties with Russia, and then they signed up a deal in the end of May or in May saying that they were getting their supply of nuclear fuel rods from Westinghouse, and Westinghouse built our reactors at the Ringhole and other places, so it's no surprise there. Um, and Vattenfall is denying the story. And I think these companies are also denying the story. But in general, this uh, program 
was saying that these companies still have ties. So, you know, the question really becomes, is this uh, continued corruption? Are these companies playing loose uh, with the law and uh, setting up fake companies in Russia to deal with them? And that's uh, what this Yale research is saying. Um, Yale University in the U.S. is saying that these companies uh, quickly pulled out but then uh, set up fake companies, which immediately took over under new brand names, but really sold the same pl uh, product. So um, uh, to do this, they, they set up a uh, montage overlay where you see a chess game being played over Russian industry, including people like Putin driving a uh, heavy diesel truck, uh, and then um, played to the background music of when Darth Vader comes in on Star Wars. So uh, looks like propaganda from SVT. Um, the panel discusses how the sanctions are affecting uh, Russia. Um, and I think really what they miss here is that you have 700 million people. So that's between the United States, Canada, uh, Europe, uh, saying, hey, you should not, uh, you know, Russia, what you've done is evil and terrible, and you shouldn't do it. Okay. And, and remember, you know, the taking of human life shouldn't be done, in my opinion. Uh, and this is a very serious uh, uh, thing that we're seeing where we have this uh, invasion and you see people dying. Uh, but from if you look at what Russia is saying, and they have 145 million people, you have 1.4 million people in China, you have over a billion in India, you have over a billion over uh, all the countries in Africa, uh, then you have the rest of Asia Pacific. So effectively, you have 700 million people versus 7 billion people, right? Uh, saying, hey, this is how it should be played. And 7 billion people are saying, well, you know, we don't really have a problem with Russia. Now, remember, in the US and Europe, uh, we have ties to India. And India is doing increasing amount of production for companies out of the US and Europe, uh, especially on the chemical, on the pharmaceutical. And um, they're building the energy to do this, the energy grids that are necessary. Uh, so you know, when you look at it from that perspective of a demo, uh, democratic perspective, well, then you would have to change your view. Uh, if you're looking at it from the perspective of uh, Russia and China, and uh, Russia is selling gas into China, they're selling oil into China, they're selling it into India, and then India in turn and, and China in turn are selling these products to Europe. Um, so Russia's evading the sanctions. Uh, so to speak, and not having any problems dealing. And then in their wealth fund, they've eliminated euros and they've eliminated dollars. They're requiring purchase of their commodities in their currency, in rubles. And their wealth fund is only holding Chinese yuan and gold bullion and Russian rubles and some other commodities. You look at a story where how badly hurt is their economy? And that's where the panel says that uh, Russia needs to uh, deal with Europe and the U.S., because they talk about in the uh, production, how many goods are produced in Russia? Well, newsflash, most of the goods produced are in China and India. So Russia only really needs to keep uh, in contact with these countries. And, um, and they've survived the swift uh, debanking. Um, so they're, they seem to be doing fine. Um, and, and that's what the panel fails to uh, really discuss. Uh, and they say how that Russia will have to turn around and come back to Europe. Um, but we'll see. Uh, in, in the meantime, uh, we look at a uh, uh, overall story where uh, this week we're going to get the PMI and logistics um, questions being answered. How are we doing? How is the economy developing? How are the rate hikes uh, hurting or helping? Um, what are we, uh, we going to see in terms of Eurozone consumer confidence, the U.S. consumer confidence? Um, we're going to look at uh, unemployment rates from countries like Japan. Uh, we're going to look at uh, European producer price index um, and prices. We're going to look at the U.S. ISM uh, non-manufacturing PMI. So we're going to get a lot of economic figures this week, uh, and that's going to be helpful for where we can see the rates going. Uh, Norway doesn't think that they're going to have to raise rates anymore. Uh, Sweden, you know, we're looking at at least, I think, 50 basis points. The U.S., you're looking at 50, possibly 75, perhaps the same here in Europe or in Sweden. Um, uh, you know, so we're going to see what happens. We have uh, Nordea. Uh, they've come out with statements about where they think the rates will be in the summer for the consumer, and that's closer to six. And I think if there was somebody who was very good at uh, predicting where uh, Stefan Ingves was going to go, 
that was Annika Vinst over at um, Nordea. However, how she weighs in now on um, uh, Tallinn, I think it is, uh, or Tadin, uh, how you pronounce his last name, um, we'll see. We'll see uh, how good her gauge is on him, on the new uh, Swedish Fed head. Um, but I think uh, really the real problem is that uh, the Swedish press is not discussing is um, what's happening with our economy and what's happening with our economy going forward. And um, one of the rising stars of our economy, um, you know, of course, we have companies like, uh, you know, Hennessy Moritz, which is firing people. Um, we have these other companies, uh, some uh, in, you could, you could say are British nowadays uh, in the pharmaceuticals. Um, we have some new biotechs and pharmaceuticals. Denmark still has quite a few pharmaceuticals. Um, we have this battery company, Northvolt. And um, now uh, what's important here is that Europe and European cars, we're gonna be using it. So if you look at Volkswagen, look at BMW, um, you look at uh, even this company here uh, that used to be 100% Swedish, that's now Chinese, owned by Geely, and that's called Volvo. Um, where are we gonna get the batteries from? Where are we gonna get these car batteries? Where are they gonna re, uh, refurbish them? Uh, where are they gonna build the Giga plants? And it had looked like Northvolt was gonna to stick to Europe. So where would they have gone? Could it have been Spain? Um, probably not anymore. Uh, could it have been Germany? Well, obviously, if you look at what happened to BASF and the last two quarters report on uh, cost, and then you look at the German uh, GDP, uh, despite we're not talking about the DAX, the market can go up. We're talking about the actual cost. So what companies run on. Um, if you look at what's happened to the German economy, they are pushing out manufacturing. Okay. Uh, Ford is leaving Germany for electric vehicle production. Uh, BMW was going to do their B, uh, electric vehicle production in England. They've now gone to China. So Great Motor or Great Wall Motors is doing their batteries there. And um, so uh, Northvolt, will they stay in Europe or with Goldman Sachs as an investor and probably the lead book runner on the IPO, uh, which they had hoped to do, they said this a year ago, within the next two years, and had wanted to do it in last year's market, will probably be doing it this year, where will Northvolt build its next factories? Would it be in the US or would it be in Europe? Certainly not gonna be in Asia. I don't think it'll be in Asia. Um, this was supposed to be a European company for Europeans. It's looking like it's gonna be a European company that shifts over to the US and takes advantage of the subsidies of the Inflation Reduction Act, okay? Just like Freyer did, which is a Norwegian company that builds gigafactories in Georgia now with Koch Industries or Coke Industries. And um, so if you need further clarification, take a look at what Freyer, F-R-E-Y-R, -E, uh, -E is doing in Georgia and uh, how they're building down there. And I think you get a clearer understanding of what this Northvolt 20 billion IPO will look like and how it will operate and work and why it would be Goldman Sachs uh, potentially, I'm saying, you know, this is all potentially as the lead book runner on the deal. Um, so this is, uh, this is where we stand. Unfortunately, uh, European um, uh, governments are not really taking it seriously, the, uh, the inflation problem and the energy problem that's associated with it. Uh, we're not building the, um, the energy grid to uh, deliver us away from this energy crisis. Uh, and if you need further reading, I would tell you, look at Doomberg. Uh, they have a great substack today talking about how coal, although is the uh, one everybody turns their nose up at as an energy source, is revived as a result of these closures of uh, nuclear plants and uh, lack of gas production. So in Europe, we're not doing any fracking, okay? Uh, we shut down the, uh, the field productions in uh, places like the North Sea. Uh, so we lose that. And uh, so we're relying on uh, most of our fertilizer from countries like Russia, uh, which we can no longer deal with. So we're gonna have to turn to other countries that are gonna do this uh, production. So maybe in Africa um, or not, and uh, maybe from the United States or not, we'll have to see. Uh, we're getting our natural gas now from Norway and from the Middle East. So maybe we'll be able to offset this and we'll see more uh, uh, fertilizer production on our own. 
Um, but uh, right now we're not doing enough for our energy production to really get us out of this trap. And uh, we're moving or we're, we're forcibly transitioning the economy over to a simply service economy and very little manufacture on our home turf. So we'll see how this affects us. Um, you look at what the United States did in the 50s through the 70s to now, and you get a good idea. Uh, add in the Keynesian economics, which Europe loves, you know, so Frankfurt School of Economics versus, uh, say, Austrian. Um, so Hayek versus Keynes. Um, you know, this is this is just a model of what's happened. Um, and, and if you look at the wind turbines and you look at the solar panels and you look at the shutting down of nuclear, you can look at Germany and how that's impacted them. And just look at what happened to BASF, B-A-S-F, on their energy cost, and you get the understanding. Uh, look at what's happened in California. Look at what's happened in Texas and how the energy grid and issues and transition to unreliable uh, or un or intermittent fuel uh, powering the electricity grid creates problems for their production. And uh, you, you get an idea of what's happening in Europe. And uh, so even though here in Sweden, uh, we've said that we're committed to building at least two nuclear power plants, we really should be building something like 10. Uh, you see Poland is trying to build two and Germany is trying to shut that down. Uh, Holland is trying to build a new one um, or saying they want to build a new one after shutting down the uh, the gas fields. Uh, you see that Belgium looks like they're going to be, hopefully they're going to build, uh, excuse me, hopefully they're going to build, but it looks like they may shut down. You only see building of nuclear power in the east, you see in the Baltics. Um, so Europe is really running into a, a question of how are they going to solve this energy crisis and when do you actually wake up and smell the flowers um, as opposed to uh, the springtime, when you plant the flowers, you generally have the smell of manure because you're waiting for the flowers. And um, that's kind of where we are. Uh, so uh, if, you're, if you're looking for, but uh, in terms of a correlation, uh, what we see in the market, um, remember right now, uh, this is a market of perception uh, as opposed to fundamentals. So if you look at the fundamentals within Germany, you see a lot of uh, insolvencies, you see foreclosures, you see companies coming out with unexpected costs due to the energy. So not a place you'd want to invest. But if you look at market performance, they've been one of the best markets to perform and uh, one of the best investments you could have made in terms of an index. So um, this is not a market of fundamentals. This is right now a market of perception. So Will Europe increase rates by 50 or 75 basis points? Uh, will the European or Swedish uh, interest rate hit six in the summertime? Um, and as long as we don't see more than that, these markets are likely to move upwards. Uh, so, uh, you know, is, is the U.S. actually uh, doing well as an economy or is the market doing well? Uh, you know, it, it all depends on whose brew of coffee you're drinking and uh, who you're listening to. Uh, so what I would say is, while the perception is working in our favor, that's where you can make money. And uh, so talk to your investment advisor for uh, your strategy. And, um, you know, you can always make money in the market. Um, you can always subscribe and hopefully you've liked our uh, channel. Uh, and we'll see you again soon. And thank you very much. And remember to speak to your advisor for your investment advice. Thank you.